254. My name is Maxwell Wasike. This time round, we're going to speak about the state of boxing in the country with a man who was a team manager for the Heat Squad in Tokyo Olympics. Of course, they just concluded championship and is also the public relations officer for Boxing Federation of Kenya. Shugare himself, an international boxer. Good to see you, Shugare. Nice you, Mark. You are telling me that we were talking about side shows instead of talking about your own. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> and of course, these are off air shenanigans. Of course, when you are off air, we are talking with Sugar Ray about a lot of things, the, uh, you know, side shows that happened in Tokyo, Japan, their stay at the village. How is it like? Considering uh, it's COVID 19 pandemic, no mingling, no interaction. A, I don't know. When you come, when you hear uh, those who have been to Olympics before speak, and now you compare to what we experienced in Tokyo, it's totally different because basically it's like we were, we were somehow prisoners mm. because we could not interact with the Japanese public. So we were in the village where we are about 11,000 of us from different nationalities. Uh, when we come out of the village, you get into a bus taking you to a competition venue or practice venue. And then after the competition or after the training session, you board the bus back into the village. And there are very serious security screening being done, getting into the village and out. No, especially getting in. So the accreditation card has got some barcodes whereby once, if you get out of the village and you maybe you go somewhere else, not the competition venue where you're supposed to go, then you are going to be tracked using the accreditation card and when you are coming into the village you have to be screened so that you go and place the accreditation card on on some machine and then it reflects your photo in the computer so that they are able to confirm whether you are rightfully supposed to be the one getting into the village using that particular accreditation so they were very thorough in terms of security uh, there was not a lot of mingling Every day we had to do COVID tests and I think there were very few cases, positive cases within the village during the time you were at the games. Uh, I think it was, it, was, it was tough considering that uh, especially when you go for the competition, there are no fans. It's, on, it's mainly the boxers who are participating, mm -hmm. who are coming maybe to watch how their opponents are playing so that they are able to strategize for them going forward and it was not very lively in terms of lack of fans in the arena but I believe it was a wonderful experience for those who are able to get there and compete. All uh, in all, how was uh, our performance? Uh, our performance was not the best. Yeah. I believe each and every, every one of the boxers gave their best. Uh, one one case we were not very happy about was the one involving Nico Koth. Our first match. And that was the first bout yes. against a boxer from Mongolia. Yeah. Yes, I, kn I know the Mongolian is also very experienced, considering mm -hmm. somebody who was in Rio and mm -hmm. go to the third, I think, go, third stage at yes. the Rio Olympic Games. He's three times Asian champion. And so we knew it was it's somebody who was a bit experienced. I had done research on him. And we gave a game plan to Nick, which we were able to implement very effectively. And Nick was able to neutralize the opponent very effectively, such that during the first round, the guy could, was not coming forward. Normally, he comes forward, attacking to the body. But we told Nick he had to stay far, wait for him to start, and then he counters. Yeah. First round, the guy was not doing what we normally, he normally does. So we had to change strategy in the second round, which was, again, very effective. Uh, for first round, Nick lost. Second round, he won. Third round was the decider, and we thought Nick dominated that round. But to our surprise, the decision was 3-2. The, the judges were split 3-2 in favor of Mongolia, and that's how we lost that bout. Again, unfortunately, the organizers of the Olympic Game Boxing Tournament, who is it's not AIBA, who is the International Federation in charge of boxing, yes. it was IOC Boxing Task Force, they had removed appeal mechanism. So once a decision is entered, yes. you cannot appeal against it. So it was very unfortunate and very frustrating for us because we thought 
that Nick had won that fight, but everybody saw what happened. Mm. And it really got into his mind. I even re I remember I saw some interview he did. And some he video crying. clip went viral, him talking yeah. and apologizing to Kenyans how, contrary to their expectations, he didn't perform as they anticipated of him. And I think people sh showered him with a lot of praise for being a great patriot and just for honorably accepting the defeat, even it was not deserving. Yeah, he's our commander, he's a captain, and uh, he leads very well. Normally he's our, I don't know, somehow it's a coincidence that when he go for a major tournament, he's normally the first one to get into the ring. Mm -hmm. uh, and he opens for us very well. We also did, he did very well. Unfortunately, it also disappointed the other boxers who look up to him, especially the next to get into the ring was Christine Ongare the following day uh, and how she was affected so much because she was even speaking about it that if this can happen to Nick, what will happen to me? Yes. Uh, but again, even her, she was competing again as a very experienced boxer from Asia, uh, Philippines in particular. Uh, I would say the person she was fighting again is normally competes at bantamweight level, which is about 54 kgs. Yeah. And they were competing at flyweight, which is for women is 51 kgs. And for her, she weighs about 48 kgs. Oh. So in terms of weight, she was disadvantaged. In terms of physique, she was disadvantaged. So in terms of power, again, she was also disadvantaged. But she did put up a good fight. And, and again, also, she also, she also says she got pressure in that our sports CS came to watch her fight. <laughs> and she was saying that she had the pressure of fighting this opponent and <laughs> she knew she had biased officials and now she had to please our, our <laughs> minister. Yes. But I thought it was a very good gesture for the CS to come and watch the fight. Uh, where I was, I waved to her, she said hi. Uh, it was good. Uh, I will say, we competed against very formidable opponents. The draw was not favorable to us. We got some very, very tough fight because the next after Elizabeth, after, after Christine, it was Elizabeth. No, it was Elia Joey. Yes. Heavyweight. And he was fighting against Cuban, four times world champion. And Cubans are extremely talented in boxing. Yes, they are the superhouse. They are the main, mm -hmm. the real deal. In boxing, do we need to do some say. benchmarking from them? Actually, we really need to. Is there a partnership, a collaboration system between Kenya and Cuba? I understand. I understand there was an MOU which was entered into when uh, former CS, Echesa, was a CS. I think they went to Cuba and together with the, with the president. And I believe there was an, there's a deal that was done, but unfortunately it has not been implemented. I hope that one can be implemented because for Cuba, Cubans are doing so well. They are the ones who won the tournament in, uh, in Tokyo. They won four gold medals. And in the first bout heavyweight category, uh, Julio de la Cruz from Cuba was meeting Elia Joy from Kenya. Uh, it was a, f a tough fight. For us, we knew it was tough because Julio Cruz, we all know about him. We know his tactics. And I would say amongst the people that fought Julio Cruz in Tokyo, Ajoy could have fought him the best because he, uh, we gave, the strategy that we gave Ajoy was not to go forward looking for De La Cruz because De La Cruz boxes with his hands down and he's very flexible and uh, his legs are very fast. So you will be cheated that you are seeing a target on the face and the time you are going to hit the face, you, you know, the punches are coming from where you're not seeing them. Yes. Because normally you expect the guard to be up, so you're seeing these punches coming. Yeah. Him, the, the hands are down. So you just hear, you just meet with punches. Uh, Ajoy, Ajoy fought well, and I believe he lost to a better boxer. Generally, you what's your complain. assessment and overview about the competition? Is there a need for uh, Kenyan boxing stakeholders to go to the drawing board so that in the next championship, we perform better as yeah, expected. I believe, I believe, I believe we, we really need to go back to the drawing board because uh, I, I can say in terms of officiating, there's something, there's something, we are, there's something yes. missing, there's a link. Mm -hmm. uh, we really need to try and get our officials 
to be at that level so that they can be also telling us what is it that these judges are looking for because sometimes you go for these major championships yeah you don't agree with with the kind of judging that's happening uh, you you wonder what is it that they are looking for because sometimes a boxer is aggressive he's landing more punches yet when the decision comes out yeah. it's not what you expected I, I, again I, i've got one question to ask uh, not only kenya <laughs> but africa because uh, you realize that uh, the only medal we got i think was ivory coast or ghana no ghana ghana yeah ghana got a medal in boxing and that was the only medal we had in africa what was our major undoing our major undoing i'll say without blinking my eyes covid uh -huh, yes most of the boxers who represented Africa at the Tokyo Olympic Games yeah. competed in the Olympic qualifiers which were in Senegal in the month of February 2020 yes and they never got into the ring until Tokyo Olympic Games there mm. were no tournaments being yes. held because of the covid pandemic yes for us Kenya we were a bit lucky that we were able to participate in two international tournaments which was zone three boxing championship what well, that was in in the month of march in kinshasa yeah. and then the next bout we were fortunate to participate in were the krotkov in russia in the month of may hmm. those are two tournaments yeah. so by the time you are going for for the olympic games our boxers the one who had most bouts from the time he qualified which was uh, all, almost a period of about two years, was Nico Koth having participated in five bouts, mm -hmm. which is a bit which is inadequate mm -hmm. because normally, you know, even our local league is not running. So there are no, lo there are no local tournaments and there are no international tournaments to gauge yourself. Yeah. So uh, I would say in terms of preparation, that's where most African countries missed a lot of opportunities to prepare their team adequately for participation at the Olympic Games and it showed in terms of the performance because you see Cubans, uh, Europeans performed a bit well when it came to the medal table. I would say COVID really affected Africa so much because there were no tournaments for us to participate in and engage ourselves as part of preparation and just going to the gym and doing your normal training, sparring, it's not the same as competing in a, in a tournament environment. It's very different. Uh, in few, uh, maybe in the past, when Kenya, Kenya was a powerhouse in boxing, we used to have so many international tournaments. You could hear people talking about Bangkok, uh, Thailand. It, uh, it used to be, it, the official name was King's Cup in Thailand. Uh, it was a big tournament. We had Intercup in Germany, we had Eastern Central, we had Fescaba, Africa Championship. Nowadays those tournaments are not there. So we require to have a lot of exposure for our boxers to compete against some of these Europeans so that when you meet during a major tournament you have that experience of having competed against some of them and you are able now, you, you improve and you are able now to gain com confidence so that when you meet them, maybe maybe now in your next major tournament you expect, we have World Championship this year, yes. but I believe where our performance will be gauged very well will be in the Commonwealth Games, Birmingham, yeah. because the Cubans will not be there, uh, Americans will not be there, so we are going to, uh, maybe or even the Russians, mm -hmm. so we are going to be competing against mostly African countries and the British colonies, yeah. and I believe there we are going to do much, much better uh, if we are able to get good preparation uh, going forward. And I believe we are more than capable of going out there and winning these medals. We just need to correct a few things here and there. And then now we also need to invest in to invest so that boxers such as Nico Koth, Elia Joy, who are aging. Yes and are just about to retire. We need to have young guys coming up to replace them so that these young guys, we can also give them exposure. And when it comes to this major tournament, they can be able to go out there and compete effectively to replace the ones who are aging. Considering that uh, boxing was one of the discipline that is not usually on the traditional Kenya's uh, 
medal table or Olympic uh, disciplines, which we usually go for because we go for athletics majorly. And boxing is one of those that makes to the Olympics, which is not our traditional mainstay. Mm -hmm. And we have had that drought for, I think, 33 years That's without a, a medal in the boxing category. Which was the major lesson you took from Tokyo going forward for you? No, I want to, I want to correct you first. Yeah. Boxing is the only other sport mm -hmm. other than athletics that has won Olympic medal mm -hmm. yes. in Kenya. Yeah. And we have won a total of seven medals, including mm -hmm. Robert Wangila's gold medal in 1988. Mm -hmm. And we have won best boxer at the Olympic level, that is 1968, Philip Waroinge. Waroinge. He won a bronze yes. medal mm -hmm. in Mexico 1968 and won Valbeca Trophy for best boxer. Yes. So, and he also won silver medal in 1972 Munich Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. So yes. we have a we have a number of medals we have won. Mm -hmm. So it's not right to say <laughs> that we are not in that basket. We are more hopeful mm -hmm. uh, when we are going to compete at the Olympic level than some of the teams that uh, represent the country. Uh, but I believe it's a high time we also try and win medals because, uh, it, uh, like we rightly said, it's, a be, it's been a while. From 1988, that's when we won our last Olympic medal. Yeah. Uh, and in that games, we won gold for Wangila and bronze for Chris Sande. So I believe it's a high time also we try and prepare and uh, see if we can get to that level where we can produce young boxers who can compete at that level and be able to win medals. Uh, we noted that uh, most of our opponents are much, much younger. Yes. We had two mm. boxers who are about 38 years, yeah. and they are competing with boxers who are about early 20s. Mm. And it's tough when you are boxing against those young guys. Yeah. They have got the strength. It's not, it's not, it's not easy, and yeah. uh, probably just like what we see also in football, where yeah. it's not easy for somebody who is 38 years to be getting a big contract unless you are Ronaldo or Messi. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to age factor, we need to invest in our young guys so that we have guys who can replace the ones who are getting older effectively. And, you know, it's not just replacing so that you're able to go and uh, maybe represent the country in the Olympic Games. It's being able to represent and maybe be able to challenge for medals. And it looks like it's been a smooth sailing for Boxing Federation of Kenya since, you know, Jamal Otieno rose uh, to presidency of the association and the preparations for the boxers, the eight squad uh, representatives in Tokyo Olympics was fairly well because even the team was training in Lovington at the fitness launch and even everything was scattered for them. So I think we can exonerate BFK when it comes to, you know, complaints of poor preparations for the teams that represented Kenya at the Tokyo Olympics because going by our social media reports, mm -hmm. <laughs> people have been condemning, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Kenyan Federation honchos mm -hmm. for failing to prepare the athletes properly. Uh, Can we exempt BFK from that blame? Yes, I will, without a doubt. Uh, for anybody who has been following boxing, you will understand the kind of arrangement that we had as Boxing Federation of Kenya to prepare the boxers. And we provided them a very conducive environment where we have state-of-the-art boxing gym at AV Fitness in Lovington. And it's an environment that even the, the our National Olympic Committee was not able to sustain for us to use as we prepare for the Olympic Games because we moved from AV to Kasarani, where in terms of facilities is not the same. Mm -hmm. And even when you ask the boxers themselves, they'll tell you the difference that they encountered, changing that environment from Lavington to Kasarani. And when we got to Kasarani, it was supposed to be a bubble, bubble training camp. And uh, again, it's when we got to Kasarani that we got our first case of COVID in the team which was not easy and which most people don't know about and i can tell you when you encounter a covid case during training camp it's hell because boxing it's a contact sport uh you don't know how much or whether the case you have has spread to a few members of the team because we operate very closely 
So once we encounter a case in, uh, in the camp, it meant losing about five days until the next tests are done, because I think we are doing tests after every 96 hours. It meant losing that much time in terms of doing sparring, uh, awaiting the next test and confirmation of who is clean, and so that you know what can be done. Because again, we had to, to train you you're following the government measures of social distancing. And you see, being a contact sport, you know, somebody hits you on the face and you are very close. So it was a bit, it was, it was a bit challenge, the kind of preparation that we had at Kasarani. COVID presented a very serious challenge to the preparations. And uh, instead, I've, I've also had almost similar cases with athletics. Uh, I think I saw something in, on TV yesterday about uh, the guy who under 20. One under 20 Wanyo championship. Wanyoji gave a story and I felt for him. Wanyoji of race walk or of no, 800, 800 meters? The one for because most Wanyonis dominated the competition. <laughs> yeah, the Wanyonis did wonder this time. Mm. And uh, you know, he was very impressive. So he was saying how he had tested positive. Then a few days to the race, he tested negative, and that's how he was able to participate. And I could relate to that because we experienced the same during our camp. Yes. And I, I know what it is. And even psychologically, it really gets to them. And he rightly said that most people are so fearful mm -hmm. of getting COVID than the race. How, how is this bubble camping? For the first time getting introduced due to COVID-19 pandemic, I think it's a global practice where athletes are confined together so that uh, they don't get subjected to uh, infections related to the uh, disease. Mm. How is it like? Uh, that's, well, when you talk about it, uh, that's ideally how it's supposed to be, whereby well, once you actually you are tested before you get into the camp. And once you get into the camp, you're not supposed to go out. And whoever is out is not supposed to come in. But I think there was a problem somewhere. I don't know in terms of organization, because the guys who are serving us there were commuting from home. So I thought that was a weak link which needed to be addressed because if it's a bubble, it's, it's supposed to be 100% bubble. Even Nobody, for medical officers? Even for the staff who, uh, who are operating in the hotel, because we have people who are cooking for us. And if them, they are going outside and coming back home, of course, we don't know whom they're interacting with. And you know, COVID does not choose where you work and your status in life. Ever anybody can get it and anywhere. So it was a bit, it was a bit of a challenge. That's how ideally it was supposed to go. We get in, you're not able to come out. And when you are out, you're not supposed to come in. But uh, we had a weak link in terms of some staff who are operating there were going out and coming in. Uh, but I believe the last, the last few days when we were just about to go out to Tokyo, that's when it was corrected. But uh, it, it's very tough. Uh, having to stay in that control environment. But again, I think they were also preparing us for what was likely to happen in Tokyo because in Tokyo, again, we encountered a, a more strict this time because uh, if you violated any of those, there were penalties. And the worst of it could be revocation of your accreditation status, which uh, it was very, uh, okay, you are lucky nobody encountered that. But it will have been very unfortunate if you're having to be returned home because of not observing the the COVID uh, measures that have been put in place. And we had also signed some code of conduct which you were supposed to follow. We had been sensitized enough. So I think we were good in terms of preparing us for what was to happen to us when we go to Tokyo. General Ishugaraz, we wind up. Tell us about the World International Day for Boxing yesterday. Oh. What did you do with yes. it? Yeah, yesterday we, we celebrated. And I didn't know that World International Boxing Day normally comes on 28th <laughs> of August. I know, I know you thought it's supposed to be... 27th. 27th. 27th, yeah. No, it's because you've been misinterpreting what are, uh, the ones in December 26th. <laughs> Boxing Day. <laughs> <laughs> Considering where I come from, yeah. I'm justified to misinterpret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yesterday was, uh, I think it's the first ever. Uh, yes. International Boxing Day, and we were lucky enough to be chosen as one of the centers 
main centers actually in Africa where we were to host the celebrations for the day. We organize an event at uh, Nyayo National Stadium. We try to call about five people from all counties that have boxing and we facilitated them to come to Nairobi yes. for the event and we had a successful day. Uh, we were joined by some officials from the Ministry of Sports, from the National Olympic Committee. I was particularly impressed by Secretary General, Mr. Francis Motuko, who really... Yeah, I saw the video with, clip. He mm. trained with us and uh, I think he had fun. He enjoyed. Uh, he's a good dancer. Yeah. So we started <laughs> with Zumba as part of the warm-up for the sessions. So we had a, a three-hour session where we were training and hosting some some bouts, exhibition bouts, mm -hmm. so that we, uh, we celebrate the day for boxing. And we called boxers who are young or as young as uh, nine. And we also had veterans, uh, some of the big names that brought so much glory to this country, the likes of uh, Stephen Moshoki was there, George Foreman, Joseph Akasamba, mm -hmm. so those guys who did us proud during those days. And uh, we also had hit squad. Yes. Uh, they were there, all of them. Uh, we gave certificates to the veterans for just to appreciate them for their efforts uh, and service that they've given to the sport of boxing. We also gave out certificate that uh, the coaches who did some IBA mm -hmm. star one coach, which yes. we were able to conduct here in Hilton, it was virtual. Uh, so the the officials who uh, who qualified. You know, and the exam is very strict. You have to get 80% and above for you to qualify mm. to be a star one uh, coach. Yeah. So we had nine people whom we got their certificates and we handed them to them yesterday during the World International Boxing Day. And it was big, more so in Belgrade, Serbia, because that was where yes, the Sabia, main... Sabia. Uh, Sabia was Manu the main was, center because yes. that is where we are going to have the World Championship this year. Okay. Yeah, so mm. we, in, sometimes in October, mm -hmm. Uh, we will be able to send some boxers there to represent them during the World Championship. Finally, what's happening to our, you know, uh, lady and someone who brought glory to this particular country? I've seen her trending for the better part of yesterday, Congestina Cheng. Oh, because Congestina. Uh, government had promised that it would, you know, put her into rehab mm -hmm. so that she can get re reformed mm. and uh, she can regain her normal status like she was before because she's someone who did uh, exemplary achievements for this particular country mm. during her heydays. What is happening and as BFK are you seeking to intervene because it looks like situation is getting out of proportion? Uh, for Congestina's case it's very unfortunate what, he, what she's going through. Uh, first I, I want you to understand <laughs> the roles Mm -hmm. Because yeah. Congestina was not in amateur boxing. Amateur, amateur boxing, or nowadays it's called open boxing. It's what we do. Yes. It's this, now, as we are able to go represent the country in the Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, uh, Africa, Africa Championship. And Congestina was in pro. Was in professional, yes. which is technically under KPBC. Yeah. Uh, but as a, as a federation, we can always give support. And actually, I know uh, our president was involved in getting her to rehab. Uh, those are, I think most credit went to former governor. Uh, for CIA? Sonko. For Nairobi. Yeah, when he went into rehab. So, uh, but they were working together with our president, uh, Mr. Jamal. And we took Congestina and Bilali to a rehab. But sometimes I think her problems um, are beyond rehab. Yes, actually, and she has gone to rehab now twice. I believe there was another another time when uh, Radul, Carol Radul, organized for her to go to a rehab, which was in Thika. And she stayed there for about three months. And she completed that very well. I know Radul had a bigger plan of seeing how she can be helped in terms of get, uh, making her to be active and maybe even also facilitating maybe the caregivers who are taking care of her to be able to get a means of earning a livelihood so that uh, they are able to support 
the efforts of trying to now take care of Konje. Uh, I'm not sure if she's getting any, any support at the moment from the government, though promises have been given before. But sometimes these promises are given and they are for, forgotten, immediately they are given. So I think it's a high time we also try to appreciate her as one of our heroines. Because she did, she did the country proud when she was fighting. She used to tell us to come early because she's going to finish the job quite early. So I believe it's a high time that also maybe the government takes a serious initiative of trying to assist her. Sometimes her problem looks more psychological. I don't know. It's, it's, Leave it to the doctor. it's, it's something much technical than yes. us just talking about it here. Oh. Because I have, I have seen uh, some of the initiatives that have been held to try to, to assist her, but somehow it keeps recurring. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't speak about it authoritatively because I think from a medical perspective, we need serious psychologists to look into it and tell us what, exactly what is she suffering from. Uh, I think so what, what I saw trending was something like she burnt her house or something. I'm not sure, I don't have evidence if for real she did that. But I think her problems are much bigger than just asking a federation to assist. Let's hope that we will get to the bottom of what she's going through. Constantine Cheng, of course, someone who did this country proud, bringing glory back home. But right now, a lot of predicaments medically, and as he said it psychologically, she might be facing a lot of problems. But we very optimistic that it will be solved soon. The government will intervene and all the relevant boxing stakeholders locally. Sugar, it's been an honor coming through your parting shot as we wind up. Uh, uh, from the boxing perspective, I think uh, as a federation we are going to try our level best to see if, uh, how we can continue keeping our boxers active. We've been very disadvantaged from the pandemic point of view whereby our sport was not reopened. I think from, from the time when we got our first case in the country, We've not been having boxing actively going on across the country. Uh, luckily for national team, we've been able to go to some international assignment, but we think we really need to do something so that uh, we are able to reopen boxing, even if it means having to vaccinate all the boxers and seeing how we can put up measures to be able to hold a few tournaments before the end of the year. So we want to assure our fans that uh, we are going to do everything possible to bring back uh, the sport of boxing. We might not do the league at the moment, but we can organize one or two tournaments to be able to keep our boxers busy. And we want to invest more in, to, in our youth so that we are able to get young boxers coming up to replace those who are aging out. We also need to put a lot of emphasis in women boxing because come 2024 Olympic Games in Paris, uh, we are going to have equal number of boxers for men and women in the spirit of gender parity, uh, which is being spearheaded by the Nas International Olympic Committee. So there is a very big opportunity for young girls to come join boxing, and within the next three years, they'll be able to represent the country at the Olympic Games, joining some of the pioneers who have done that and that is Christine Ongare, who was in Tokyo 2020, and uh, Elizabeth and Diego, who represent the Kenya in the London Olympic Games 2012. Thank you, Dan Kankuri, also known as Sugare International Boxer, formerly. Of course, he played the sport and is currently PRO for Boxing Federation of Kenya, and he was the team manager for Heat Squad in the just concluded Tokyo Olympics Championship, joining us this particular afternoon to share his insights with regards to the state of the sport in the country, and he says the future is very bright. We're looking forward to see how that goes. Of course, the line continues until 3 o'clock. In the next few minutes, Arsenal will be up against <laughs> Manchester City in what is expected to be, I don't know whether you call it a mouth-watering clash, because some people saying that, you know, it's sort of a one-sided affair, but you never know. In football, anything can happen. Of course, that's coming up next, but the fan zone is due to happen in the next few minutes. Don't go away, stay tuned. Arsenal.